when I do my, my guest lectures um, in business schools, 95, 97, 98% of those lectures end with a little bit of career advice where I talk to students about this. I say, you know, it's easy to find, you know, we're, we're in a business school environment, you're going to graduate, you're going to go out and look for a job. It's easy to find a job, you know, where you're dazzled by all the sort of conventional buttons, you know, the salary and the perks and the uh, status of the brand, you know, I work for Nike, you know, or I, geez, I work for Google. Welcome to We Need to Talk, where we try to figure out how to find fulfillment in life and reduce dissatisfaction. Listen to this entire episode if you'd like to hear excellent advice on what to do with your life if you're in your 20s in a way that will really propel you forward. And continue watching if you want to hear really good advice on how to avoid a trap that a lot of adolescents fall into or young people when they begin their early career. So enjoy the episode and don't forget to, subs to subscribe. Let's go. Welcome everybody to We Need To Talk. This podcast is dedicated to trying to figure out how to find fulfillment in life and how to reduce dissatisfaction. My name is Henry, the host of this channel, and we are joined today with two very interesting people, Neek and Rob. Rob, do you want to start off with uh, introducing yourself and telling us anything you think is important uh, to know for the listener? And Neek, you can follow then afterwards. Sure. I'm delighted to be with you all. Um, I'm Dr. Rob Britton, and I am uh, currently an adjunct professor of marketing at Georgetown University in the United States. Um, and I have had a long uh, and I would say very happy career, since we're talking about happiness and satisfaction, a long and happy career in the, uh, in the airline business. Um, some of you may think that's a sort of a disconnect, given the fact that the airline industry right now is in the midst of sort of existential crisis. Uh, and certainly the time that I, that I worked in it, there were plenty of ups and downs, but it was, a, it was an awesome career. Um, just as, as introduction, I'm uh, originally from uh, the state of Minnesota in the north of the United States, um, spent half of my life there, <clears throat> earned a PhD in geography of all things uh, at the University of Minnesota actually started my working career as a lecturer in geography. <clears throat> Excuse me, I didn't like it very much. I wasn't very good at it. Uh, and so I went back to business school. I retooled myself and that's when I got in the airline business in 1984. So essentially my, really virtually my entire working career has been in or near the airline industry. And even though I teach part-time at Georgetown and am a guest lecturer in 25 or 30 business schools every year all over the world, lately all done via Zoom. Um, I'm still really kind of an airline guy at heart. Uh, and in addition to the teaching that I do, I have a small consulting practice, um, small meaning it's just me, uh, which is great because I'm the boss and I'm also the worker. <clears throat> um, and, um, and I've been doing that whole thing, sort of part-time teaching, part-time consulting uh, for about 14 years ever since I took an early retirement uh, from American Airlines. So I think that's a, a adequate introduction. We're now physically in, um, uh, my wife and I, and uh, physically in Washington, D.C., or nearby to Washington, D.C. It's a rather interesting place at this time of, uh, of our existence, uh, of our republic. Um, yeah, but we've lived in, the, so we've lived now really in three places in Minnesota. Uh, we lived for 25 years in the state of Texas. Um, and now we're, we've been in Washington for about eight years, but I'm really kind of, a, I know it sounds like a bit of a cliche, um, but I, I'm really, in, in, to a certain degree, kind of a, a, a global citizen. I'm not necessarily, you know, some sort of <clears throat> believer in universal government uh, <clears throat> or any idealism like that, but I, I certainly consider myself to be um, fluent in, not languages, sadly, but fluent in um, the ways uh, of many, many countries, mainly uh, in the uh, mainly in the EU, EU, mainly in Europe, but I've I've taught in all over Asia, um, in Latin America, and so on and so forth. That's a little bit of a long-winded introduction. And I'm sorry for that. You can edit out whatever you need to, when you, whatever you need to to, to edit out. <clears throat> no, that was excellent. It's good to understand that you have a versatile background. So your I think advice will be, I would say well developed or let's say an, uh, i'd say broadly fitting to a lot of people i think that's super valuable 
and I'm very excited to hear your uh, sort of advice from a cosmopolitan sort of experience, experience background, let's say. Uh, sure. Nick, do you want to shortly introduce yourself? Sure, sure. I'll keep it a bit shorter. So my name is Nick. I'm uh, currently in Zurich after studying for four years in Rotterdam. Mainly did economics and fiscal economics over there. And then I'm here um, doing more business courses. Really like it. And I had the privilege to attend one of the courses of Professor Rob Britton. It was a, a lecture on leadership. So it was about 10 lessons of leadership. And that was very interesting. Uh, moreover, um, yeah, I'll be in Switzerland for the next year, finishing my uh, my bachelor's and then next year going into most likely a master's uh, in Switzerland as well, preferably in business or strategic management. So that's where the lectures came in very useful from a uh, professor. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Let's start with the first question. Now, Nick and I are both in our 20s. And the big question is, what should we be doing? How should we allocate our time? What should we focus on? What should we fight for? What should we work for? Rob, what would you advise people in their 20s to do with themselves, with their time, with their focus? Well, I, that's a that's a that's a pretty big question to start with. I was hoping you'd you'd start with an easy one. Uh, that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big that's a big question. I mean, look at um, I, you know most people. Um, that are seeking, you know, a career, a satisfying career in, uh, in, 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 in the world of business or in government or the private, you know, the public sector administration, or, or for that matter, with a nonprofit organization, you know, uh, much of their twenties, at least their early twenties, are spent, uh, uh, you know, continuing to learn, uh, and. Um, I'm a big believer in. Uh, obviously, I'm a big believer in education. It has served me well. Um, and, and so I'm an advocate for, for learning, but there are many ways that we can learn and they're not always just in the classroom. And so I, for example, just as a specific, I, I rather like the idea. In fact, I, I strongly endorse the idea that students should, once they complete their bachelor's degree, uh, if they're seeking additional work, that they should go out and work for um, some years before they go back and take a master's. Because in my experience of 30 plus years as a guest lecturer, I always find that when I'm in a classroom with older students, um, either uh, full-time MBAs who here in the United States, typically a full-time MBA is in his or her um, late twenties. Um, or if I'm in, for example, in one of these so-called executive MBA programs, where the students are much older, those students, because they've had work experience, um, are, are, are simply put better students. They, they know more, they're more likely to engage me, um, they're more likely to debate me, to push back, which I love. I mean, I don't have all the answers, gosh. Um, so, you know, I think that's one, that's one piece that I, that, I would, that I would offer is that, you know, work experience in between. Now, one of the nice things about the German system, or for that matter, uh, systems in many parts of, of Western Europe, uh, is that the opportunity for working while you're studying is really good. Um, you all in, in, in Europe have a much um, more, a much highly, much better developed um, internship system, you know, and I find it fascinating if you start to sort of peel back the, the internship system um, and the idea of learning on the job. I mean, you can go all the way back to trade guilds in Germany, you know, in the 14th century, you know, where some kid that wanted to learn leatherworking or whatever, you know, went and did that. So, but that internship idea is, is, is super strong. So, so, so work and learn, learn and work, do those kinds of things. Um, I think, you know, it, it, early on, um, it, people in their 20s, uh, if it's possible, uh, and of course right now in the pandemic it's not, but we're going to get over that and it's going to be possible again to travel, okay, to get out into the world. And there's all sorts of opportunities nowadays to do that. I was the beneficiary of that hugely. In fact, that's probably one of the, re one of the things that informs my, my global perspective is that when I was in my late teens, early 20s, I traveled a great deal. I, I went around the world. I hitchhiked across Australia. I lived in youth hostels. I, I, I actually worked in Spain and, and in, briefly in Germany. Um, so, I mean, that traveling idea uh, is really strong because it gets you out of your comfort zone, uh, gets you into another environment, 
Um, and it can be any environment. You know, I don't have, you know, you know, somebody says, well, where should I go? Just go anywhere. Um, you know, it can be an exotic place. Uh, it can be a, a place that seems very familiar, but even the most familiar places, right? For me as a, uh, as a, as, as a person in my late twenties, I actually worked in Australia uh, for a year, late twenties, early thirties. Uh, and even though Australia, you know, has an Anglo American, uh, an Anglo tradition, you know, settled in, you know, sort of culturally very similar roots to the United States, it's a very different place. So go travel, work while you're learning, learn as much as you can, get a, just a, a variety of experiences, get into some different experiences because, you know, what happens soon enough is that oftentimes the opportunity for varied experience begins to narrow. Mm. That's, I think, excellent advice. I agree with it. So what you're saying is exposure to different, a variety of environmental stimuli is super valuable. But why is it so valuable? Well, I think it, you know, I, yeah, it's a great question. I, I think it's, it's valuable. And this is going to sound a little bit exotic, maybe, but, but I think it's, it's, it's valuable for the, for the same reason that if we look at ecosystems, if we look at nature, um, nature loves diversity, right? And the most successful ecosystems in the world, um, think of a wetland, you know, biologists, uh, and I'm, I, I'm hardly anybody that's all that knowledgeable about about, about the ins and outs of the natural world. But I know enough that, you know, it, 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 that, eco, that, 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 that wetlands uh, are very complex ecosystems and they're also very successful. And to a biologist, success means they're stable, right? And, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in them and, and you know, each of the species can flourish and so on and so forth. So it's kind of that idea. I think the mind is an ecosystem to a certain degree where you know, if, we can, if we can introduce a variety of, of stimuli, um, we're going to be better off. And, and we need to introduce those things, by the way, while we're young and while our minds are still forming because you know, both in a, in, a, in, a, in a very real biological sense, and you probably know this, in an anatomical sense, our brains are not fully formed really until we're well into our 20s, right? So in a biological sense, and then I think also in a cultural sense, you know, we, you know the, the more variety that we can introduce, the more perspectives that we can have, the more, and frankly, the more dissonance we can introduce. You know, for example, when we visit another country and we see a culture and we wonder, well, why do they do it that way? And that seems wrong. And then we start to try to understand it. I mean, those things are all really positive. Mm. Mm. So you're sort of, I like the comparison to an ecological uh, sort of system. Are we, are we talking about survival rates then? Well, I mean, that's the way, obviously that's the way that, that biologists, you know, it's a bit too deterministic, but that's the way that, you know, biologists would tend to measure success. Uh, but for humans, it's obviously much more complicated than that. Uh, but, but I think we could take your question and I like the fact that you're, you're pushing back a little. I think we could take that that idea of survival and define it not just are we are we vertical or horizontal, if you catch my drift, but you know how what what does surviving really mean? I mean, are we you know are we fully formed humans? Are we you know are we reflective enough each and every day to think about our our, our situation and how we're related to others and what we're doing and are we happy and you know all these kinds of things? Are we you know blah blah blah? Yeah. Mm. Well, what's your I, uh, I think it's awesome that you said sort of, well, you sort of implied reducing humans to survival is a bit too simplistic. Like, like there, there's something else going on here. What, 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 is, what else is being included in this package of survival or this sort of purpose? What's... Well, I think, it, yeah, yeah, I, exactly. Uh, exactly. I think it gets back to you know, you, you guys and, and your, 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 your podcast, your premise uh, about sort of seeking or trying to define or trying to understand what constitutes satisfaction uh, in, for, for humans. What, 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 is, what is another word that I like to use is, you know, what is fulfillment really? What is that for? What is that for people? And obviously it's different things for different people, um, but we have to start to think about um, what, you know, what those things are and expose ourselves, you know, to enough different stimuli, as you would say, to, to start to get a, a sense of what that is. I mean, for example, you know, in, because I spend, 
most of my classroom time in, in, in business schools. You know, in a business school environment, you know, um, satisfaction and fulfillment is almost always defined around how good a job are you gonna get, right? Or what's your starting salary gonna be? Or are you gonna get a signing bonus? Or are you gonna get a company car, an Audi? Oh, you know, and you know, that may, that may or may, you know, that may or may not be the, the, the way forward. And, and um, you know, I, 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 when I do my, my guest lectures um, in business schools, 95, 97, 98% of those lectures end with a little bit of career advice where I talk to students about this. I say, you know, it's easy to find you know, we're, we're in a business school environment, you're gonna graduate, you're gonna go out and look for a job. It's easy to find a job, you know, where you're dazzled by all the sort of conventional buttons, you know, the salary and the perks and the uh, status of the brand, you know, I work for Nike, Ooh, you know, or I, geez, I work for Google, you know, uh, but you know, you get there and then all of a sudden, you know, you get there and the salary's nice and you get your first pay, pay packet and oh, isn't that nice? And, and then, you know, after two or, three, two or three years, or maybe even after a week and a half, you realize it's not for you. It's not fulfilling. It's not what you want, right? So you really, you know, I, I think that, it, you know, and so for a lot of people, you know, career is important. So, so it really means, you know, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but it really means, I think, first and fundamentally, you know, if we're thinking about how important work is to our, to our satisfaction or to our daily life, then, then that whole question needs to have a lot of thought. And you need to, every young person, again, back to this advice for the 20s, you know, really sorts to, really needs to think about, caref think carefully about, you know, where are you going to go to work? What do you really want to do? Is it, do you think it's going to bring fulfillment? Is it going to bring satisfaction in the work environment? Because, you know, work is a big part of, you know, of who we are, but that's not all of who we are. And, you know, when I was with Nick in the class a couple of weeks ago, you know, I talked about, you know, this need for a balanced life, right? And again, it gets back to this, it gets back to this whole idea of, of variety and stuff. So away from work, you know, work cannot be everything because if, if we allow work to be everything, then we lose our partners and we lose our friends and we lose, you know, our hobbies and we get, and we get fat and, you know, our lifestyle goes to, goes to shit. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, we've got to have, you know, so I'm, you know, introducing here, you know, another, you know, sort of a piece of advice. I mean, it's work-life balance. Mm. Okay. I think uh, I've got a lot of questions jumping in my head now, but Nick, I, do I, you want- I probably, I probably should stop drinking coffee now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can still, I'll still try and ask them later on, but Nick, do you want to mm. ask a question on the work-life balance? Topic. Oh no, yeah, I still have one more question around the, the goal setting in, in, in one's twenties. This is more of a personal question. Is do you have like any regrets of things you did not do in that time, like during your twenties? Um wow. Uh yeah, that's a yeah, that's a that's a super good question. Um I, I think I, I'll answer that kind of on a on, on a sort of a uh, sort of a more sort of a personal level and a professional. I think on a professional level. I think when I was in graduate school, uh, and remember, I didn't take a conventional route. I, you know, I, I, I have a PhD in geography. Um, I did a pretty good job of, of, of very, in graduate school of varying up the courses that I took. And you know, I was very interested in economic development and sustainability, even you know, sustainability. Believe it or not, people in the 1970s were talking about sustainability. It's not Greta Thunberg that invented this idea. Um, but you know, so so I think I would have benefited from. Uh, a bit more variety in my in, in my coursework, a little bit more exposure to other things if I could have done that. Um, and, and part of that was I was, <clears throat> and this probably comes down more over on the, on the personal side or maybe just in between personal and professional. Um, I was really focused when I was in graduate school on getting done quickly. Um, a lot of people in grad school, especially outside of of business topics, if you're studying in the physical sciences or the social sciences or humanities, you know, they, they, they think graduate school is like a, a, a place to be for a long, long time. I thought it was a place to be for four years. So I went through it rather quickly. And I, I think you're looking back in retrospect, if I would have spread things out a little bit more, um, I would have, for example, then had time to broaden my scope. For example, I mean, I could have taken some courses in the management school. You know, it was right across the street from, you know, where the geography department was, and I didn't do that. So I think that would have been a, 
would have been would have been a good thing. You know, I think also pro- part of that looking back in the twenties, and I certainly counsel young people about this now. And I'll come back to what I said a moment ago. You know, travel more. You know, I should have done probably two more years of traveling. I had a sort of a gap year between undergrad and grad school. I should have probably done, you know, two gap years, three gap years, four gap years. Um, you know, really get out and, you know, get, get out into the world a bit more than I did, because I don't, you know, I think you, you can't sort of have too much of that really in your twenties. Well, so that's not really, it's not really advice I've heard very often is to take as, let's say a generous amount of gap years and, uh, travel, but well, that's yeah, yeah. You certainly wouldn't hear it from your mom and dad. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. So, um, yeah. awesome, Nick. Do you want to ask the a question? Work life balance. Yeah. So I think I, I already asked the question in the in the leadership course actually about this, but the, the question is indeed how does one like really on a practical level balance both indeed like work life, but perhaps more importantly, um, also work family and work family life. 